so let us say we have three constraints the blue the red and the green and together this is the feasible space that they form okay so this is the feasible space this is how this is how it looks now let us take this black dot as our reference let us say i have some objective function and for that objective function it turns out that this point in in the interior of the feasible space is optimum local minimum let us say local minimum then what should have happened at this point to call it as local minimum what is the reason why we are calling it local minimum what be the condition that should have satisfied there hmm? no improvement so for any for sure there are feasible directions everywhere only condition that should have happened there is there is no improving direction for example if i look at the gradient for this function if i look at the gradient the gradient for this function will be the, the gradient of the objective function at this point will be equal to zero okay that's the only reason otherwise we will never call it as otherwise we'll never call it as optimum why because if there is an improving direction let us say if this is the improving direction then we'll move to a new point and that new point will be better than this point so if there is any if it's a bit not neat but what i'm trying to say is if there is any improving direction around this point because all these directions are feasible so if there is any improving among all these feasible directions then you can immediately improve so the only reason why we cannot improve is that the gradient of the objective function at that point is zero that's the only reason why we call this optimum is the idea clear any doubts any any questions yes yes can you repeat this so i'm saying that this point here this point here if we say this is optimum for some objective function then the reason why we are saying optimum is that the gradient is zero at that point okay the gradient is zero at that point and by optimum i mean local minimum okay from most of our talks is about local minimum okay clearly okay clearly now let us say the point is here and now somebody said this is the local minimum somebody said this is the local minimum so what are the possible reasons for this point to be local minimum we always have the same reason actually right that there is no what is the reason for this point to be okay there is no improving as well as feasible, feasible direction uh, gradient okay. so improving and feasible direction now what are the feasible directions for this point with respect to the green constraint how will the gradient looks like for this constraint? remember the constant green constraint is less than or equal to type so the gradient will it point inside or outside for the less than or equal to type I'll constraints point. the gradient will point it will point outside okay it will point outside and the gradient can be drawn as perpendicular to the tangent so this is how the gradient is going to look like at this point and all these directions which are here are feasible directions okay all these directions are feasible if that is the case how do you think the gradient should be if your goal is to minimize how do you think the gradient should look like let us say that if the gradient was like this will this point be optimum if the gradients were like this uh, this direction is the positive of the gradient this direction is the negative of the gradient and we are trying to minimize if you are trying to minimize no. what are the 
directions that we, we try to move for minimization. For minimization, what is our reference? The positive of the gradient or the negative of the gradient? Negative, right? So we like to move along the negative of the gradient, closer to the negative of the gradient. And these are all the directions. These are all the directions which are closer to the negative <coughs> of the gradient. These directions make angle less than 90 degrees. So if this is how the gradient were, yes? Why would we go to our get on? I'm able to hear you. There's a noise. Can you repeat, please? Why we move toward the negative gradient? Because if you move towards the negative gradient, the function value will reduce. And for minimization, reducing the function value is what we want. If you move to along the positive of the gradient, the function value will increase. And then if you move along the negative direction yes. of the gradient, the function value will decrease. And for minimization, we would like to decrease the function value, right? OK? Abdulaziz. Yes, OK. OK. Let us say this was the configuration. This is how the gradients are going to look like. Then can you tell if this point is optimum? Can you find a feasible and improving direction? Can you find a feasible and improving direction? No. Well, if you see improving, if you move along the gradient, or closer to the negative of the gradient, you can improve. And then you have a feasible. There is an intersection of this black region with the green region, right? You see, there are so many directions that are common. So I, I could improve anywhere here, and I could get a better point. So this is not how configuration looks like. How about if the negative of the gradient was like this? Can you find an improving and feasible direction? Yes, for example, if I move like this here, I have lots of improving and feasible direction. How about now? Can you find an improving and feasible direction? You see here at this point? No, because there is no intersection. All of this black region is for improving direction, and the green region is for feasible, and there is no intersection. So at this point, there was no and feasible direction okay now let us look at this case here we have two constraints the red and the blue that are active how is the feasible feasibility going to come from the red constraint because it's linear there is no need for tangent so the gradient is perpendicular to the constraint And this is how the feasibility going to look like for the red constraint. So all this direction in this red zone are feasible with respect to the red constraint. Similarly, with respect to the blue constraints, this is how it looks. Yeah. yeah. Then the intersection of these two, which is the intersection of this red and the blue region, is giving you the feasible directions, right? So those are my feasible directions. Now let us say if the gradient was like this, if the configuration was like this, then can you find a feasible and improving direction? Our goal is to minimize. So can you find feasible and improving direction? Yes, yes no? Yes, yes. Because yes. there is an intersection of this black region with the feasible direction. OK. How about now? Can you find feasible and improving direction? Yes, we can. How about 
Now, feasible and improving direction. No. Can you find a feasible no. and improving direction? No. Yes. So you see the movement, this orange or the negative of the green arrow is passing the blue arrow. There is no feasible and improving direction. And here, there is also no improving and feasible direction. How about here? Is there an improving and feasible direction? No. no. How about here? Is there an improving and feasible direction? Again, no. no. But the moment you cross the red line, the moment this orange line crosses the red line, you see that there is some improving and feasible direction. So whenever this orange line is in between the blue and the red, you will see that there is no improving and feasible direction. So can you tell me what is the condition that should happen at this point to become an optimum? The condition is this orange or the negative of the gradient should be between the blue and the red or the gradients of the constraint. Okay, now maybe this is the new thing for you. So just please pay attention. If you have, let us say two vectors, it's a vector a and let us say vector b then any vector which is inside of this a and b okay any vector which is inside of a and b let me color it can be represented like this let us say that vector is c any vector c which is in the cone of a and b is written like this Some let us say scalar S and scalar. Okay, let us don't do this. Let us say some scalar mu one and mu two. Okay, maybe this is the best. So take any scalar mu one mu2 which are greater than or equal to 0 which are non negative and multiply it with a so mu is a scalar a is a vector so how to multiply a scalar with a vector do you know how to multiply 3 with this vector 1 2 3 what will you get can you multiply a scalar with a vector yes you can multiply and the multiplication goes like this element wise so it will be 3, 6, 5. Okay. So take a scalar non negative, multiply it to the vector A. Take any other scalar, which is also non negative, multiply it to B. And then when you add, you get some vector inside. You get some vector inside the cone formed by A and B. Okay. So this is how you can get any vector inside those two vectors cone. And there is a name for it actually. You call it as conic combination. Okay. You don't have to remember this name, but remember the idea. If you have two vectors, get a vector inside the cone, you take two scalars, non negative, multiply with those vectors, and get any vector inside. So if this point is optimum, it means that I have two. Vectors and what are those two vectors? Those two vectors are the gradient of the second constraint and the gradient of the third constraint at that point. So these are those two vectors. And how to get any vector inside this region? How to get any vector inside this region here? It will be nothing but some constant, for example, here let us say some yeah. scalar, not yeah. constant, no, but some scalar, non negative scalar, multiply to this. Okay. 
some non negative scalar multiply to this vector and this will give you any point sorry any vector between these two vectors right and for this point to be optimal what do you want you want that one of the vectors should be the negative of the gradient okay so you want that all this to be equal to negative of the gradient and if you can find such mu2 and mu3 if you can find such mu2 and mu3 such that this is true then you know that the point x bar is local minimum why because there is no improving as well as feasible direction okay guys so you got this idea so let me write this condition again so if you take the gradient okay if you take the gradient of the second constraint and multiply it with some non negative scalar and add the multiplication with the gradient at the third constraint and if you can generate the negative of the objective function gradient and if this condition is true that means x bar is indeed local minimum okay this is how it looks pictorially now why did i select constraint 2 and constraint 3 why didn't i select constraint 1 what was the reason only 2 and 3 why not 1 hmm what is the reason we selected only 2 and 3 because here if you see here only 2 and 3 are participating constant 1 is not at all closer at this point it is bit far constant 1 has no influence at this point okay it is not active you can say it is not active now here we can look at the figure so i could say that at this point the red and the blue constant are active what it means is let me just clear the picture here if you see at this point only blue and red constraints are active and that's why here you have red and blue gradients and that is the reason why the green gradient is not participating but if you, you cannot if you want to write a constraint like this then you have to know what are the constraints that are active and we don't want to do this so how can we write this constraint automatically how to write this constraint automatically for instance let us say i would like to write it like this negative of the is equal to let us say okay this is okay is equal to mu1 mu2 3 okay and then here you have gradient of the first constraint let us say the gradient of the second constraint and let us say the gradient of the third constraint okay so i would like to say this automatically such that uh, the mu1 mu2 mu3 are greater than or equal to 0 so i would like to say this automatically but this is not true at this point only the red and the blue gradients are active the green one is not active right so i would like to convey the same information but i would like to write it in general like this so how to automatically make mu1 zero now to make mu1 zero we can say it like this either the constraint should be active or either the corresponding 
scalar, mu should be zero. What is the meaning of constant is active? What is the meaning of, let us say, the constraint g to x less than or equal to zero is active at x bar? We have it's seen this before. Right? Can you repeat? It contributes or it's with the, with the point. Okay. Point. So at that point x bar, g2 of x is satisfied as equality. It means the constraint is active. Okay. Similarly, if somebody says constraint g1 is active, what does it mean? g1 is active at a point x, let's say x bar. It means g1 is satisfied at that point as equality okay so now we know what is the meaning of active constraint and then we have the scalar so we could say that either either mu1 is 0 or g1 of x is 0 similarly either mu2 is 0 or g2 of x is 0 now how to say these two together and how to say these two together can you come up with a mechanism to say either this should be zero or the other one should be zero? Well, you could just say mu one multiplied by g one of x equals to zero. So if I write this condition, what will happen? It means either mu one is zero or g one of x is zero. Similarly, I could do the same thing or I could just say for all i. And now this will guarantee that automatically the gradients which are not active, the gradients of the constraints which are not active are eliminated from this constraint. Okay. So now we have built so many sets of constraint. You call this constraint as gradient condition. Okay. Gradient condition. Such Nonlinear conditions, you call them as complementary slackness. Complementary slackness. This requirement that you want the scalars to be non negative, you call it as dual feasibility. Okay. And then you have these original conditions, they are called as primal feasibility. So you have four sub conditions which are part of k k t conditions okay any doubts any questions here can you explain again the constraint part okay so let let me just show on the graph so let us draw a point here. Let's say x2. At this point, you see that none of the constraints are active. What it means is if I plug x2 in all these constraints, it will be satisfied as strict inequality, right? x2 is not touching the boundary, right? So if I plug in x2 in any of these constraints, it will be satisfied as strict inequality. For example, if I write here g3 of x2, it will be strictly less than zero. So that means g3 is not active at, at x2. Similarly, if I write g1 of x2, it will be strictly less than zero. And same thing with g2. Okay. So those mean those constraints are not active. Let us pick another point here. Let us say here. Let us call this point x3. At x3. At x3, tell me what will happen to g1 of x3, g2 of x3, and g3 of x3. g1 will be equal to zero and the other g1 will be equal to zero and the others for sure will be strictly less than zero. 
it means g1 is active or the first constraint is active at x3 and everything and the other constraints are not active similarly at this point let us call this point x4 if i want to do the same analysis what do you think will happen at x4 uh, one will be strictly less than and two is and be equal yes so that means g2 and g3 are active at this point and g1 is not active so that is the meaning of active constraints and inactive constraints okay uh, the active constraint should be less than zero or inactive okay so let me write it here this is inactive these are okay so equal to zero means they are active so inequality constraint which satisfied as equality implies the constraint is active okay implies the constraint is active is it clear yes yes Okay, any other questions? It is an active, it will be u uh, mu multiplied by gx not equal to zero. No, that is not the way how it was developed. I will see here in this part, we are saying that the negative of the gradient should be between g2 gradient of second constraint and gradient of third constraint right but we, we don't know in general what constraints will be active at a given point so we are we are trying to include all these constraints we are trying to include all the gradients of all the constraints but then it is not correct because only the active constraint gradient should have been included here so what i'm doing i'm saying that if the constraint is not active if this constraint is not active then what should happen to mu1 it should be how to make this thing disappear? If G1 is not active, it's then what should happen? Zero. It should be zero. Okay. And I, I didn't hear you properly. You said something? Okay. okay. So that is why we are writing here mu i g i x equals to zero. So if g i x is, is not equal to zero, it means if it is not active like this. If it is not active, then for sure u1 will be zero okay so one of them will be zero for sure either the scalar is zero or the corresponding gradient is or the function is active so that is the meaning of complementary slackness either the scalar is zero or the constraint is active is this clear is this clear guys Okay, good. Okay, so Abdulaziz, for your question, why we are defining these constraints in a now? Let me come back to Abdulaziz's question, which was what is the reason why we are doing this? Okay. Now when you have unconstrained optimization. What do you call, when do you call a point as critical point for unconstrained optimization? When do you call a point critical? What is the critical point in unconstrained optimization? Hmm? If you have a point X bar and we say it's critical, yes, that's correct for us. That means the gradient at that point should be zero. This is for the unconstrained optimization. Now, for the constraint optimization, when will we call a point x bar critical? When this x bar satisfies the KKT conditions. Okay. So, in the unconstrained case, what is the critical point? When the gradient is zero. For the constraint optimization, what is the, what are the critical points? KKT points. Any point that satisfies the KKT conditions are critical points. And do you remember what are the four conditions 
are four sub conditions that we have in KKT. One of them we called as gradient condition, and then the other one was complementary slackness. Okay, and then you have the primal feasibility, and then you have the dual feasibility. So these four conditions together makes the KKD condition. Okay, and any point that satisfies the KKD condition is called as KKT point. Okay, any point that satisfies the KKD condition is called as KKT point. So in unconstrained case, you say a critical point is nothing but a point where the gradient is zero. In constrained case, you say a critical point is nothing but a KKT point. Okay, a KKT point is a critical point. Is it clear, Abdul Aziz? Yes, clear. Okay. Any other doubts? Any questions? Not clear. Okay, okay good. Can you clarify it by example? Clarify what? Can, can, what? What exactly? KKKT. Yeah, we'll see examples. If you want to see examples, yeah, we'll have examples. There are many examples. Come. Okay. okay. Okay, so let me go to the slides now. So this is what we have seen in the animation and the conditions that we developed are called as KKT. KKT is short for these three guys, Karush, Khan, Thakkar. Khan and Thakkar, they were professors or faculty members. And Karush, I think, is a guy from Russia. He was a master student who independently built these conditions. Okay. And these are the KKT conditions. Gradient condition. Complementary slackness, primal feasibility, dual feasibility. While discussing in the figure, it was easy to discuss inequality conditions. So for equality conditions, we couldn't plot because it's very difficult to, to show graphically. But we can incorporate it very easily. And you know, it is part of the primal feasibility. It is there. For the equality conditions, you have the scalars. Okay, you have the scalars multiplied by the gradient for the inequality conditions we want the mu's or u's here to be greater than or equal to zero but for equality conditions but for equality case you want the v's to be unrestricted okay you want the v's to be unrestricted so that is how the the equality conditions can be added here For the complementary slackness, it's only for the inequality conditions. For all the inequality constraints, you have the complementary slackness. There are no complementary slackness for equality constraints. And the entire KKT system is here. You have this four group of conditions, gradient conditions. So what we did, we took the negative of the gradient from the other side and bought it here. So the negative on the other side is nothing but positive this side. So the gradient of the objective function plus some scalars multiplied by the gradient of the con constraints, inequality constraints, and these scalars are non-negative, plus some free or you can say unrestricted scalars multiplied by the gradient of equality conditions. All of this, if it is equal to zero, it means this negative of the gradient is lying in the cone generated by the gradients complementary slackness is just to remove those inequality constraints that were not active so that is the reason why we have this complementary slackness to remove those that were not active here okay the primal feasibility it is given to me this is coming from the problem these constraints are the original constraints of the nlp this was from the original problem the dual feasibility just makes sure that the multiplier for the inequality constraint gradient, the multiplier for the inequality is greater than or equal to zero. The multiplier for the equality constraints, it is free, it is unrestricted. So if you find a point X that satisfies all these conditions, okay, 
if you find a point x for which there exists u and v such that all these conditions are true then that point is kkd point so you see apart from x you have some more thing to check for okay so if you can find a point x such that there exist corresponding u and v where all these conditions are satisfied then the point is called as a then that x is called as a kkt point okay then that x is called as a kkt point is it clear any questions any doubts are these conditions only designed for minimization objective type yes these conditions are very precise to minimization objective actually the problem is very precise it is like this minimize f of x subject to gx less than or equal to so it is less than or equal to conditions okay and hx equals to some c so even the inequality should be less than or equal to type if you have greater than or equal to inequality you have to flip it and make it less than or equal to similarly if you have here maximization you need to multiply the objective function with minus sign to make it minimization so you have to remember this is our standard nlp okay this is our standard nlp and these conditions are stated for this standard nlp if anything changes here things will change here and it is very difficult to remember everything so it is better to remember everything for this standard case and then whenever you have a problem it will take some time just to convert everything to this standard style and then for that standard style apply these conditions okay is it clear clear any other question any other comments so once again how is the kkt point related to unconstrained optimization and what is the similarity of kkt point and unconstrained optimization kkt point is similar to something in unconstrained optimization similar to the critical point yes kkd point is like critical point for unconstrained optimization in fact you can say kkd point is critical point for constrained optimization okay and when do you say the point x is kkt it satisfies all these four conditions yes but, but there's something that we are missing in the in your statement so, uh, mm -hmm. We say that a point X is KKT if you can find U and V such that all these conditions are satisfied. Okay. So U and V are also important, uh, you can say part of the definition. So we say X is KKT point if there exist such U and V such that these conditions are satisfied. Okay, guys, any question, any doubts, any comments?